Hey everybody, how's it going? Zach Grant here with U of I Extension, local food system, small farms. I'm here with the Urban Egg Connect, coming at you with another vlog that I've been so terrible at getting out on a regular basis. Uh, anyway, today is uh, just past the spring equinox. I think it is March 22nd today. And I'm at the high tunnel here at the Sosuko Demo Farm. And I just wanted to show you a couple things uh, that I'm working on here. And I'm gonna splice in some video of my seed starting area uh, to come out with a vlog for you uh, for a newsletter and for the first vlog of the season so uh, let's jump in and see what we got going on so here we are in the high tunnel and like i mentioned it is march 22nd so just past the spring equinox and as you can see i'm doing a couple of upgrades in here uh, but before I get to that, just want a couple comments about some of the overwintered production. This has been a really mild uh, winter here in climate hardiness zone 5B in South Cook County. We uh, did have one exceptionally cold week in December. And I'm just mentioning that because you can see some of the damage in here. But you can also see some greened up crops that overwintered pretty well. So if it wasn't for that one week in December where we had a couple sub-zero ambient air temperature nights, we would have had you know, really consistent good winter production in here, probably even without an additional uh, row cover. So you can see some of the spinach that overwintered really well. Okay, you can see some spinach over there. You can see this spinach right here. But I'll draw your attention quickly to the last fall planting, which was this October 18th planting of white Russian kale and uh, Darkita arugula that you see right here. And this actually intact, these two plantings survived that really cold stretch in December really well because they were very, very immature small seedlings, kind of held in place and now they're growing very vigorously uh, in this late winter, early spring. You can see some of the kale uh, plantings. They took a little bit of a hit in a few patches, but survived and overwintered. All the lettuce that was right there pretty much took a hit and died. Uh, for the most part in this row right here, although you see a little bit that did survive. And then here uh, you can see, this was all mainly brassica, cold hardy salad greens, and a little bit of, I believe, uh, escarole or endive. And all of that took a really bad hit. Some of it uh, did survive. I actually need to change these sticky traps out. This is kind of a, an interesting little side note. We're, we're continuing our uh, beneficial insect monitoring program. And you can't see it here. But these are mainly all aphidias or aphidolides. I'm not sure which one. But beneficial insects. Essentially aphid predators. So I'm not seeing as much... Um, aphid pressure in here, although we can look really quick under some of these arugula leaves. Okay, all right, so yeah, we are seeing a little bit of aphid pressure, okay? But I'm also seeing, if I look closely enough, I'm seeing, let me kind of focus in on that for you. Those are the skeletonized aphids, so those kind of, let me get this one leaf off here. You can see this a little bit better. There we go. So you can see all those gold colored aphids are actually the parasitized aphids. So the, there is some balance in here. We do have some good uh, pressure, we do have some good beneficial insect action happening here that seems to be balancing out some of the aphid pressure for the most part. Now again, we don't have a lot of crops in here yet but that's a little hot spot right there. You can see some of these other sticky traps. Uh, they're not capturing nearly as many of the parasitoids as the other traps. So there's some spatial variability in the tunnel itself. But on this white Russian kale over here, I'm seeing very little, if any, aphid pressure under here. So if I just take a couple random leaves to scout and monitor, I'm seeing no aphid pressure over here. So. We haven't introduced any of the aphidolides or aphidious predators in a while. But with this monitoring program, with the work we're doing with Dr. Casey Athey, 
it's really interesting to track these beneficial populations with the sticky traps. I hate to do it because it's killing uh, the paras parasitoids because uh, they're getting stuck to the trap, but it's interesting to monitor uh, the populations that you have in here. So just another important point to remember, we're monitoring an IPM system, integrated pest management, not just for our um, insect pests that are causing our plants damage or problems, but for the beneficials as well. All right, so on to some of the new projects. Uh, one of the things you're noticing is like, hey, it looks like Zach's putting in raised beds in the high tunnel. And I haven't talked about this greatly on the vlog series or in many of my in-person lectures or training, but to, for a cost-saving measure, you know, I try to use the in-ground soil, if, the native soil, if I can, if it's not contaminated and of decent quality. However, the drainage inside of this tunnel isn't great. And, you know, I didn't put drainage in initially and I've kind of been able to get away with not growing in raised beds and applying decent amounts of compost and doing a couple of things to get by. But ultimately I decided that I want to invest in, in a raised bed system in here, in the high tunnel specifically for a few reasons. One, it just makes the efficiency of planting in the four beds in here that I'm going to build really efficient. It really, really efficiently utilizes that 30 inch bed top really nicely. Uh, it'll, it gives me that six inch. So these are six inch tall beds. Uh, it gives me that really solid top six inch layer that I can manage uh, very effectively uh, for fertility, microbial and, and physical uh, benefits. And, you know, keeping this kind of, and this is a compost soil mix that I have in here. You know, and keeping the biology really nice in that top six inches uh, is going to create, you know, eventually a nice, you know, 12 to 18 inch soil profile that I hopefully won't really have to manage that much. So as much as I love the broad fork as a tool, I don't like getting in here and broad forking these beds because it, it takes a long time. Um, and, you know, I eventually have to do it at least once a year. So and, and the other reason is that it, it'll make uh, turning crops, turning crops over pretty quickly pretty quick uh, the whereas traditionally in the in-ground soil system depending on the soil moisture conditions it, it was a little bit challenging uh, because we do mainly drip irrigation in here a little bit of overhead and the soil moisture condition is are always pretty moist so it's just it's just a challenge to manage uh, in-ground beds and tunnels it can be done uh, I've done it on other farms I see other farms do it very effectively and for a production farm, you know, you could consider raised beds in a tunnel, but, you know, this is to do all, you know, four of these raised beds in here is going to cost about $400 in one inch, uh, what they call incense cedar decking. So I, I chose a rot resistant wood, so it'll last for a number of years, but it was an expense. It was an added expense and to bring in the compost and soil. So, but for us, research demonstration it i think it works well they do it down at the dixon springside tunnel i also like how it's going to make the beds more unitized so it'll be easier to um, do replicated trials and replicated research projects in here and it'll just make it more efficient so here's the first one i built and i just did the first planting of our uh, late winter early spring this is mainly baby kale so we have some toscano style dino kale White Russian KX1 and some of the Salanova head lettuces right here. And I planted all of this at the, the, the Salanova spacing, which on the rate code is 4 4. And it's about a, you know, a seven and a half to eight inch spacing on, on the grid. And you can see uh, the grid pattern down here. So I'm going to finish uh, the rest of these, hopefully in the next four weeks. And then all of this is going to be transitioned. You know, I'll probably do a few direct seedings in here of some salad greens, but then all of this tunnel is going to get prepped for what we mainly use it for, which is our uh, sort of yearly high tunnel variety trial program, looking at the hybrid heirloom uh, tomatoes that we're growing in here, as well as I'm going to reserve one bed, one entire bed for high tunnel cucumber production. We're actually growing quite a few, uh, quite fewer varieties, well, maybe not varieties, but different uh, crop families at the demo farm this year to make it easier to manage 
and to make the rotations a little bit easier. In fact, you know, one whole quadrant of the outdoor area is not going to, it's going to mean cover crops and which we'll get to that in, in a separate video. So just wanted to show you that. I'm going to show you the updated seed starting station spliced into this video. And it'll be a little bit of a long vlog uh, to start the year, but uh, glad to get started and hope you all are having a great start to your growing season and we'll see you soon.